Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this evening's Nutshell Discussion. My name is Katie Adams, and I'm the Illinois Demonstration Fire Manager here at the Savannah Institute. The Savannah Institute is a nonprofit organization based out of Wisconsin and Illinois focused on agroforestry research and education. We truly believe that widespread agroforestry can help restore soil, build resilience, and support strong economies of cooperation between farmers, researchers, and perennial industry builders. We host on-farm field days, offer print and online resources focused on key agroforestry practices, including land access and lease structures, and the basis of establishing tree crops. And all of these are available for free on our website. We're also building a network of demonstration farms across central Illinois and southern Wisconsin, and are currently recruiting mentor farms as well as applicants for our second year of our agroforestry apprenticeship program. During this evening's discussion, if you're joining us from a computer, I want to invite all of you to share your questions and comments in the chat box of this platform. We'll monitor them throughout the nutshell and make sure to address them during the Q&A session at the end. If you're joining us by phone, I'll give instructions on how to ask a question after Drew's presentation. And just for everyone's FYI, you are currently muted during the call. Okay. So now we're on to the main event. We are so honored to welcome our presenter for the evening, Drew Slevin. Drew is the farm manager at Lily Springs Farm in Osceola, Wisconsin. It's a 100-acre regenerative farm and preserve at the edge of the North Woods. Lily Springs Farm's purpose is to simultaneously restore ecological health and build a perennial-based food system that integrates land and people. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Drew to get things started. So give us one second while we switch presenters. You got me? I got you. Welcome, Drew. Thanks for joining us tonight. Nice. Hi, everyone. Thanks a lot, Katie, and thank you, Savannah Institute. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm really delighted to be here, and I'm, I'm delighted to be, uh, you know, connecting with peers in this, uh, in this movement of, of uh, perennial land management. So um, tonight I want to introduce um, some ideas that we've used to invite birds uh, to our farm. Um, so this is inviting birds to your landscape uh, for pest management. Uh, again, I'm Drew Slevin. I'm the farm manager at Lily Springs Farm. Uh, I'm going into my fifth year, and uh, the project has been awesome. I'm really, really thrilled. Um, so what to expect from this presentation? I, uh, I do not hold a Ph.D., uh, that's me on the dock of, uh, of our lake here on the farm. Now, now the farm straddles this lake. It's, it's uh, very poetically named Mud Lake in, uh, in Wisconsin. That's a very common lake name here. And you can see there are a bunch of swans behind us. That's my buddy Ringo. And uh, so, yeah, I, I do not hold a Ph.D. I am a professional land manager at this point in my career. And prior to this, I was in the professional realm uh, doing personnel management. And, and uh, I was really attracted to the food justice theme that's taking place uh, in the outskirts of the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. So it kind of spills up into northwest Wisconsin here. Uh, this presentation will not be exhaustively scientific. I am prone to dad jokes. Uh, I'm not guaranteeing you'll laugh at anything that I say or, uh, or appreciate my humor, but <clears throat> it's there. Um, I probably cannot tell you what birds you have in your region. Um, like most of you here, like I think your main goal as a land manager is to be effective at pattern recognition. And, and so these patterns are going to apply. To your region. Um, the birds that you'll see in this presentation are birds that we have put to work to enhance our operation. Um, we've invited them into the system and they have worked for us and added value. Um, and we don't do that by like flagging down individuals. We, we create general habitat space um, and we allow the right migrant bird to self-select into our farm system and they gleefully fill the job that you're hiring for. Um, and I have a few examples that I am excited to share with you. We've been um, doing this avian ecology work now for a couple of years and, and this slide I just advanced to includes a shot of my biggest mentor and, and a homie from across town. That's Alex who works at the acreage in Osceola. Um, and to the right is Kim Grievels. Uh, she's a retired PhD avian ecologist 
and conservationist from the Wisconsin uh, Department of Natural Resources and uh, committed her whole life to her love of birds and uh, really did some amazing work. So this, uh, this presentation is written and presented with deep, deep gratitude for the work and wisdom of our mentors, our elders, our teachers, and the truth holders in our community. And, and for those of you who are on the phone, there are several logos of organizations who uh, have done important and influential work in my career here. Lily Springs Farm is the first logo on the list. There's the Savannah Institute. Um, Ecological Design is a um, really, really incredible design firm who we partner with uh, in, in uh, everything that we do out here. And uh, they've been incredible mentors to me as well. Um, the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources has done incredible work in conservation up here. And then there's a really interesting thing. If you're part of Wisconsin, uh, Bird City, Wisconsin is a thing that you should get acquainted with. And we'll talk about that a little bit as we go. Uh, this next slide includes uh, the farm owner in the top left with our herd of goats and their guardian dog. Uh, that's Nina Utney uh, helping us get that paddock set up. She's shouldering about 200 feet of fence there. And uh, this is her project. This is her vision, and I am thrilled to be a part of it and ever grateful. Uh, uh, below her is Lindsay Raybon of Ecological Design, uh, my main go-to mentor. Uh, I spend a day a week with Lindsay walking around the project and evaluating our progress on things. And to the right of Lindsay, standing around our, our whole housing, or whatever you call those, I don't know how to pronounce that. It's either, they argue about it, whether it's German or Swedish, the round uh, wood stack. Uh, but that's Kenny and Ellie. Um, we've we've really been lucky to attract some good talent here uh, this last couple of seasons. And so as the team goes, we've been doing cooler and cooler projects. Um, before we get too far into the presentation, I want to start with a land acknowledgement of, uh, of the land here at Lily Springs, um, partly because you know, it's it's uh, prudent in in the the current you know uh, climate that we're in, um, but also because it connects us to a history that is so necessary to understand in order to wrap our heads around the plight of these migratory birds. Um, and and that really is you know the last people who managed the land that I'm working on right now were Anishinaabe and Ojibwe that that were working with nature. Um, the prior residents uh, all all attended to the land with a pretty violent and uh, industrial approach. Um, and, and as we know, as, as indigenous people were shuffled around, our ancestral knowledge of the North American continent was lost and replaced with monoculture. Um, it's, it's important that our work here honor our ancestors on the land uh, by how we walk on the land, how we teach from the land, and how we work to decolonize ourselves. And, and, and you know, this is, uh, uh, I'm not saying it because it's cool or whatever. <laughs> I'm, I'm saying it because I really feel that this style of land management represents a paradigm shift that is going to uh, restore ecological sanity to this continent. And, and I, uh, I hope that you're all very proud to be a part of it. I, I'm very, very proud. I think that this is very, very meaningful work to, to reconnect and, and let the land teach us. Um, what it needs. And we can exercise some creative agency in trying to figure out how to make a living while not completely destroying this incredible thing. So this image is uh, a whole bunch of swans on the lake um, with the moon kind of in sort of an isosceles uh, uh, format here. And the, the tree line around our lake edge um, behind this image um, is the, the typical oak savanna ecology that we see in this region. Um, characterized by legacy trees and, and mid-level trees and grassland below. Um, it's pretty dense. We're working it with these fellas. Um, so uh, the left side is a pretty obvious before and after shot of where the goats work and where they have not yet been. Um, <clears throat> they're incredible at what they do. And, and so 30 acres of our uh, property include a, a red pine plantation. This is pretty typical up here, and, and we consider ourselves lucky, actually. You know, if this pine plantation weren't here, uh, that would have been in corn, and so this would have just been subject to erosion and chemical use all these years. Um, so, yeah, currently it's uh, totally overgrown with poison ivy, prickly ash, buckthorn, uh, really nasty stuff, and, and this team of uh, happy goats uh, really model these regenerative 
principles for us. They, they do the job we want to do the least, and they love it. And they're so fun to watch when they do it. And our job is just to keep them moving and, uh, and keep them healthy. And it's been great. Um, that's one aspect of the farm. And, and what we find is our birds uh, that go to work for us have access to the finest insulating material available <laughs> to, known to goat. Uh, yeah, so this, this goat fur gets recycled, upcycled. We see it every year. Um, oh, okay, so it's important. I, I realized uh, that this was not just going to be a, uh, a conference call and this would be on YouTube shortly. This is a picture I, I found on Google uh, to demonstrate a little bit, but this is this is kind of where I think it's going to get interesting for everybody. This is uh, um, an introduction to the Wisconsin Stopover Initiative, uh, the time for citizen science. Uh, I think this is so cool, and and a lot of you probably will connect with this. So, um, for those of you who don't know, and and this is totally like I, I wrote. I'm going to describe this as an idiot's guide, like how technic how technology changed bird survey work. Literally, this was done for a long time. Like, they would put a net up through a migratory zone, snag birds, and while they were disoriented, they'd, like, clamp a little, you know, gently. They, they were nice about it. They'd clamp a little band for research purposes. And, and you know, that's tedious and, and uh, not very replicable. And so, basically, what, what we've figured out in the last several years, and, and I'm abbreviating and, and I'm not going to go into all of the technology, but you know how your cell phone uh, works pretty well for identifying where you are and like like where you're stopping and and so basically the idea is they replace these clips on the bird's legs with an RFID chip and now they can track very very closely and and so the data that was coming back on these migratory birds um, shocked some researchers it was not shocking to those of us who are paying attention to uh, balance and nature. <laughs> Like those of us who remember that we are nature working. Uh, so, so yeah, they basically identified that these birds that were stopping with access to perennial polyculture, um, birds that were stopping in an area that was not just full exposure to the sun, like obviously that's, that's a desert. They're not able to uh, uh, make it to the next stage of their migration. And, and, and so here we are back to, um, a little bit of my land acknowledgement, right? Like the, when we switch to monoculture, um, these birds that, that really, they winter wisely in uh, this one area of Costa Rica. A lot of the birds that move up through uh, Wisconsin, a lot of our raptors, a lot of our songbirds, in the winter, they're, they're in like blissed out jungle life. And then, and then for summer, you know, in their DNA, they know that this is where they need to go. And, and they, they forge out into the unknown. And uh, they, they're, they're hit with 125-degree chilled fields and, and poison. And, 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 like, all of our windrows are disappearing. And, and uh, a lot of our old-growth forests are gone. So, like, the incidental encounters that they would hit with nature on their way through their migration are, are gone. Um, there are large gaps, and the, uh, this data that was coming back basically told avian ecologists the specific recipe for how to get, okay, so subject 542B only made it 30 miles on their migration from yesterday, but subject 542F, the same category or whatever, made it 200 miles. Let's go check out at that stopover site what it had access to. And so then that information was shared and the Wisconsin DNR started to set parameters for individuals in, um, <clears throat> you know, private land ownership, holding a yard or up to a farm. How can private individuals uh, get in the game of providing uh, habitat for these migratory species? And they devised this really cool, like, like if you're into us, join up, you can do anything from a fire escape up to a five-star resort. Uh, so the idea of a fire escape would be like you've got some water out. There may be a couple of perennial plantings that you've got, you know, at least water, maybe a feeder. That would be great. Um, a lot of these birds are looking for cavity nesting opportunities. 
So if you're a land manager, we'll get into a lot of the different forest things that you can do. And, and um, But anyway, yeah, this is the premise, the, the Wisconsin DNR Stopover Initiative. It started in the Lake Michigan area, and we were really lucky. After, after Kim retired, um, she started hearing about us and just kind of opted to take some fun vacations to western Wisconsin and see what was happening over here. Um, so here's just a couple of little trivia bits about uh about forests and and this is stuff that's kind of new um so so you've got oak leaves on the left and you've got some recognizable maples on on the right and the petiole on the oaks is obviously far shorter right than the petiole on the on the leaves on the right um the reason that this is up was an avian ecologist maybe like five years ago um spotted you know we we always attribute oaks to being able to host up to, you know, 250 species from, from below the soil up to the canopy. And, uh, and he was studying why it might be a more hospitable uh, place to hang out for, for a songbird. And, um, and you can imagine now if, let's see, did I include that slide? Pardon me one second. I'm going to pop right back in. Okay, no, I had a couple of uh, technical challenges today, and I didn't have a slide. There was one that documented the average number of worms and bugs per stem on a uh, on an oak branch. But the idea is, so if these leaves are like uh, like a big plate in the sky for where a bunch of worms and caterpillars are hanging out, the bird can just stand on the branch on the oak tree and probably reach over the leaf and peck out a few of the things that are on there without having to fly off of the branch and inspect the leaf aerially. And, and when, when the songbird flies off the branch and inspects the leaf aerially, it blows its cover and it, it's far more likely to get picked off. It's far less safe for a songbird to live in a maple, it turns out, than an oak. So, uh, not a huge point from this uh, lecture, but a point nonetheless. Um, this was a garden that received a five-star rating from uh, the, the DNR. And, and, you know, it's a nice place to hang out. Not an over-elaborate uh, design. You know, there's, you can see some milkweed in there and, and uh, a lot of native plantings. Uh, wood chips are good. Moving water is really, really good. Partial shade, nice. Yeah, it's a good spot. Uh, here are a couple more tips before we really get into the, the practice that we did out here. So, um, and this is something that is so easy and super fun. Uh, the Cornell Lab put out a couple of these free apps, and, and it's basically to kind of build on this momentum that they're getting about migratory birds. Um, there's the Merlin Bird ID app. I highly recommend it. Uh, it's a free download. It asks you five super fast questions and tells you a list of birds that are in your region and asks you to identify it. And then when you click on it, there are multiple pictures that it's connected to. You can listen to calls. You can listen to chatter between that species. You can look at uh, immature specimen and female and male. It's really, really, really useful. And then uh, a companion app that they've developed is called eBird. Um, you can provide that data to the Cornell lab. So after you ID the bird, now you're an expert, tell them what you saw, and then they'll track it. And it's really, really thrilling, especially in a place like this. It's, it's so common to see one that's like rare, uncommon, uh, pretty nice. All right, so my first big goal, and if you've ever been to Wisconsin, uh, you know it is a horror film of mosquitoes. Uh, at certain times of the year, and black flies in the earlier time of the year. Uh, so I was very, very interested in the opportunity to create habitat for birds that would help me manage mosquitoes and black flies. Um, if, if the investment is a uh, few rent houses, which run, you know, 10 to $12 or whatever, um, these are the specs that you want to use for a rent house. They're, they're usually made out of cedar. They've usually got an inch and a quarter entrance hole, four inch square internal space. Um, we group them to attract social aerial hunters. And I'm not going to just breeze over that. We're going to talk about that a bunch. Um, so that by grouping, I mean you would hang three or more. I set them six to 10 feet high, about 40 feet apart. 
and that creates a spacing that seems to be like they like a little bit of privacy, but they like to be close enough to hang out. Um, if you plant your or if you set your uh, birdhouses too far away, then you'll attract solitary hunters. Um, they they won't be effective at picking off uh, mosquitoes and black flies. Um, try to make the houses visible from the sky, face opposite of the prevailing winds. So on all of our maps where we've analyzed how the the energies move over the land here, we're, we've noticed prevailing winds are moving northeast. They come from the southwest or, or from the northwest, usually from the west. Uh, so all of my birdhouses are generally facing the east in, in uh, this farm. Um, nearby water, really, really important too. Uh, another approach for managing birds is, uh, I really, really love this, attracting raptors to manage for rodents and more. Um, so I've always had an affinity for raptors. I've always just been mesmerized whenever I've seen them. So any opportunity to work with them or call on them to um, join the system here is, is a great one. And, and, you know, when they started banning uh, lead bullets a long time ago, they, uh, the bald eagle population in this region started coming back strong. And then actually uh, one of Kim's, colleagues uh, was the avian ecologist responsible for reintroducing the trumpeter swan back to this region, um, which is another one of my favorite birds to have around. Um, anyway, this concept of attracting raptors is, is an absolute thrill. Um, so like most perennial farms, we are constantly on guard for damage from rodents and even songbirds. Uh, a lot of you have had that experience. So we elected to, uh, and this was on, on Kim's recommendation, um, she said you can either really sink a lot of money into long posts to create some sort of, like, platform up out of your lake, uh, or she said you could stand on the back of a pickup truck and see if you could reach that branch there and take all the dead junk off of that, and I bet they'd land there. And so that was what we did uh, in the winter. You know, we waited, waited until good uh, dormant, uh, appropriate pruning oaks time in, in cold, cold February, and uh, drove an ATV back there and stood on the roof of it and trimmed as much as we could reach, and uh, you'll see the results. Um, I recommend strategic mowing for a million reasons. I, I don't think that anybody should mow their entire property at any given time. Um, I think that, uh, well, and I wrote DMZ there too because uh, I, I liked that uh, Joel Salatin mentioned DMZ as the demilitarized zone, as a margin around where he keeps his poultry, he always tries to keep, uh, uh, so the idea would be if a predator has to get to the, um, you know, the, the stuff you want them away from, in this case, it would be like berry bushes or fruit trees or, um, or, or your birds or whatever. The strategic mowing would create a highly visible area that they would have to traverse under hopefully the watchful eye of predators. Um, so my idea is to, they, they can't hang out and chew on a tree if they're uh, scared they're going to get picked off. Um, and then rock piles are another one I, 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 uh, I've been experimenting with here with the staff, uh, getting smooth river rock piles in uh, semi-shade, semi-sunny areas that will attract snakes. I, I figure if there are more snakes in the system, then there will be more raptors cruising around the system anyway, and they'll, they'll go after the rodents as well. Uh, pocket gophers are a huge problem in Wisconsin for farmers and ranchers. Um, all right, so here we are in it now. Uh, Kim, give us some tips that may. Um, we collaborated with a local farm that has a wood shop to get a bunch of birdhouses made up. I'll, I'll come back to that. This shot is Lindsay in our south field. It's a large fenced-in area. Uh, we have 300 elderberry plants of four different varieties. There's 1,600 hazelnut trees planted. Um, 300 aronia bushes, uh, we have 16 beehives, and uh, yeah, it's a fun space. It's all designed on contour by ecological design, and, uh, and uh, it's been a thrill to work in this space. Um, so right now you can see in this picture, it's in the flowering zone. In the back, you can see a couple of birdhouses hung. Now, those posts on that fence, this is a really useful spot to use for, for a trial. You know, if, you're, if your uh, post spacing is 10 feet, 20 feet, then, you know, you know how far you have to go. It's really, really simple. You just walk it out 
And uh, you don't have to worry about damaging a, a live tree or losing hardware or anything like that. Just drill into the post. So, um, so yeah, there's the idea. We maintained the service row mowing on either side of the perennial plantings. In this case, it was the elderberry. Um, I did not anticipate that the elderberry would be threatened by these birds. <laughs> so, so basically, I was concerned about my staff getting chewed up by mosquitoes from that shady wood line back there. Um, uh, it's a very, very common deal. And uh, so I set up a bunch of birdhouses on opposite sides of this elderberry planting. And, uh, and that year we were also experimenting with, like, do you harvest the flowers off of the shoulder or off of the top, or does it make sense to – so we, we were thinking the berries would get heavy on the shoulders, so we, so we harvest those uh, flowers off the shoulders of the rows. And then there was just, like, a high mohawk of berries and these birds were so set up, like they had a really, really good, comfortable environment. And, uh, boy, it was a race. We were uh, constantly – luckily, we didn't stick the farm on our elderberry harvest. Um, but, anyway, they did a great job with the mosquitoes. <laughs> and, and we recalibrated for the next year, and we still satisfied all of our customer demand for elderberry that year. Um, but, yeah, they did an awesome job for us. And uh, in a minute here, I'll introduce you to – who we attracted, um, but we use the bird apps to learn about them and, and study them. Um, these are some of the birdhouses that we got. Uh, so, so, you know, the, the whole buy local is an important thing, but also, like, if you have a friend or a farmer in your community that reliably produces good quality, simple woodwork, um, like in, in our community, we've got this wonderful farm called Community Homestead, um, their uh, Mars, oh, excuse me, you know, what's it called? Camp Hill model uh, farm. Uh, and so they're a multi-generational organization. They do a veggie CSA, but basically they've got a wood shop with all of these really sweet people that like to do stuff like build birdhouses. So I contacted them and I said, hey, uh, I'm, I'm looking at getting 20 birdhouses for this year. Is this a job you'd be interested in bidding? They got back to me, and, and so I had priced it out on, uh, you know, the Menards page. That's a shop that we got up in the Northwoods, and, and I checked on uh, uh, the venerable Lord Bezos online emporium, Amazon, uh, to see if, <laughs> see what the prices were like there. And I was seeing pretty consistently like 14 bucks for these birdhouses. And Brendan got back to me. He was like, yeah, we'll do them for 10 bucks a piece. And I was like, oh, make it 12 <laughs> And so I, I got us our birdhouses, and, and I had a little bit of fun with the pyrography pen. If there are any uh, Bruce Lee fans or, uh, or late 90s hardcore metal fans, you may identify either of those images. Uh, so, yeah, this is year one trials. We, we attracted a whole heap of eastern bluebirds and, uh, and those little guided missiles on the upper right there, those tree swallows. Um, phosphorescent blue like shark belly coloring. It was the coolest watching those birds work. And they're very social. They work together like dolphins, like they'd group the bugs and pick them off on the edges. So, so cool to watch work. The, the uh, Eastern bluebirds did about the same approach, um, but they would only work in like groups of two or three. The tree swallows would get five or six going and uh, it looked like a blast. It was so fun to watch. The bottom right, um, so our, our uh, historic farmhouse that we've got on site, uh, we use as a hosting place for weddings and all sorts of events. Um, our friends from Whetstone Farm uh, were just pulling a lamb out of the ground that they cooked overnight. And uh, I, I included this photo because you can see a few of the birdhouses that we installed. And people remarked all night at this wedding about the lack of bug pressure. It was so nice. Like, it literally was as comfortable as it looks in the photo. It was a delightful night and uh, very, very memorable because of our, uh, our migrant bird workers that uh, just did incredible work. Um, okay, so I, uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, I, I pulled a couple of images, and these are both Autobahn Society images and then, and then uh, Craig Gibson. Check out uh, birdsoftheair.com. Uh, yeah, those are the those are the tree swallows in in the left and right there, and then the upper right is a full shot of that eastern bluebird. 
just wonderful birds to share space with. They're they're all very small. Um, uh, yeah, the brow on the on the tree swallow. Everybody on the farm that worked here got acquainted with them. Like they, you'd walk by them the first day, and they would just have their beak out their entrance hole of their uh, their house. And and then you'd go to work, and when you came back, they'd be standing on the line. And in the next few days, they'd, like, actually follow you around. It was super fun. They really got comfortable on the farm. So, yeah, we were thrilled with our success that first year. And when we went back at it, you know, uh, wintertime hit. We got thinking about what we wanted to do, um, where we could where we could grow what we had as success and where, where maybe uh, we could rework some stuff. So we rearranged a couple of birdhouse groupings near the fruit and berries, uh, where, where I failed to consider the smorgasbord element. Um, we also, oh, I forgot, we had a little bit of damage on our cherry trees too. Um, not like huge uh, career threatening, but. Um, so my thought there was, that same concept from the Yellowstone example of uh, the the desert uh, uh, river valleys, right? Those those uh, those shallow rivers that had all dried up uh, because there was no root penetration to slow down the water, right? So when they reintroduced wolves, the elk were no longer overgrazing these dry riverbeds, and the rivers came back to life. My thought here is. These sweet songbirds need a little bit of incentive to keep moving off of our fruit trees, a little bit of incentive to keep moving off of our hemp. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll say more about hemp in a moment. Um, so, yeah, that was, uh, that was the idea behind uh, inviting some of these, these uh, fellows from the picture. That was an interesting situation. There was an animal that uh, was sick, and it died uh, on the lake ice it thawed and then froze back in the lake ice. So I had like a three day eagle battle. This was literally, it was taken from my living room and you can see the front house on the opposite side. It was pretty dramatic. It felt like a real patriot a whole couple of days. Um, anyway, uh, now we had been successful at some of our areas that we hung out all the time, drawing mosquito hunters into those spaces. I don't know how many of you out there uh, have places on your farm that are just like, whoa, you got to hurry. Like, take a deep breath and run for the next 20 seconds because, like, this crap is bad. Like, there are some mosquitoes and black flies in this spot, you know? And, and this maybe is just after a bad rain or something like that. There are a couple of places that, that uh, rain builds up and, and you end up like that. So check out those. Let's see if we could do something there. And we tried a couple of those spots for our second-year trial. Uh, and then, yeah, build out some extra cool stuff for the event spaces. Uh, there's that intro picture of me and Ringo. So this is, uh, I, I think, one of the interesting things about this process. So our agricultural fields are behind those pines. Um, we really have created a bit of a biofilter around this lake um, with deep, deep perennial roots and deep, deep ground cover. And... Uh, it's been interesting to see. I don't know if there's a correlation. I, I like to think that there's a correlation um, between the number of swans that come back each year and the number of, you know, wildlife diversity on the water um, as it relates to the, the filtration of the chemicals that are coming in from our neighbor's land um, and elsewhere on the watershed. Uh, the top right is a decorative uh, tree swallow habitat. That was really, really successful. I, I, right shy of the image, um, there's one post that I did back-to-back -back houses, and Kim saw that. And she was like, what are you doing? Like, why would they both live? I was like, man, Kim, <laughs> I'm just trying. Um, so, yeah, these, these are spaced a little bit shorter than 40 feet. I'm thinking these are about 30 feet. And, uh, and they all got populated. And then uh, and the wedding space below overlooking the lake uh, to the left there's another collection of tree swallows and that's you know um, lake edges occasionally have like a little inlet where there's not a whole bunch of flowing water and that's where you get extra mosquito buildup so we tackled a spot with with uh, uh, a, a tree swallow habitat actually we weren't sure who we would attract and, and we attracted a really good team of tree swallows on that side too so uh so, yeah, last year I guess I had, like, maybe, like, 30 tree swallows on the payroll. 
Um, and this was the year that we were actually able to sort of host some events, invite some friends from the community out. This, uh, this top left one was an invite that we had for a bird walk. Uh, that's a killed deer um, in our raspberries. Uh, killed deer are a protected ground nesting species in the state of Wisconsin, and they are all over our farm. Uh, and uh, so we protect them too. We're really happy about them. They're, they, I, I don't know if you know about this bird or not. They're really quirky. Uh, this is the mama. And uh, so she puts her nest in a really conspicuous spot, uh, just totally out in the open. And then when you start walking close, she's like, oh, man, look over here. I'm super hurt. I bet, I bet I'd be an easy one to <laughs> And and you, like, start walking away from the nest. And, and she's like, oh, seriously, it hurts so bad. And she's, like, wiggling her wing and dancing. And then as soon as you get close to her, she's like, psych, and peels out and flies away. It's it's amazing. She's really, really cool. We we get a bunch every year. Um, this is a uh, below a forest space that we've carved out. And uh, we did the same grouping down here. And, and this is a bunch of city kids enjoying – pretty low mosquito pressure. I think we hung out back there for like five hours. I didn't hear a single kid complain about bug bites. Um, you can see we're kind of bundled up, so it wasn't super bad. I think that was pretty early in the season. So maybe uh, maybe we were more concerned about ticks at that time of year. But um, nonetheless, it's valuable space. And, uh, and, and I think it's interesting that you can make way more off of a space like that by hosting groups in an agritourism sort of fashion than you can off of any kind of crap in, in that kind of beautiful space. Um, on the right, we've got a group of student, uh, what, activists, workers, organizers. They're awesome kids. Uh, they, they come out and get involved in everything that we do. And this is a red oak um, in our oak savanna that got blown down. It snapped uh, up by where Liam's hanging out. And uh, and we kept it because, well, I collected everything that snapped off for firewood, but this chimney is super, super valuable. And, and this type of structure um, is what birds are missing from, from all of our depleting old growth forests. Um, there are different types of swallows that would live in a chimney like that. Um, there are woodpeckers that would work that, of course. Um, it's It's super, super useful to keep... Um, also, if you're breaking down a tree, you know, if you're managing a bit of forest, you're breaking down a tree, um, when you're keeping your workspace clear, you know, you break down the top and get all of the spindly branches collected, line them up in a row, create a brush pile, and put it on contour on your hill, and you'll create habitat for either birds or things that birds will eat. Um, I get concerned a little bit about having too many of those to create mouth habitat because mice are tick incubators uh, in this region. And uh, so, you know, I want the ground nesting bird habitat. If I'm concerned about too many mice showing up, then I'm just going to try to attract more owls. And, and in these areas where we started brush piles, um, in the years since, we have... Yeah, how many how many families of owls now do I have? I have a great horned owl over here, and I have two families of barred owls in the pines now. Um, you can tell from the call and response. I'm not I'm not like uh, on a first name basis with them. Like when you're out at night, you can hear them communicating. Uh, okay, so raptor perches and and cannabis. Uh, <laughs> So this is our second year as part of the Wisconsin pilot into growing industrial hemp. And, uh, and so we did it regeneratively. Uh, we, we did it on wide spacing where we could establish a ground cover that would cool and feed the soil. Um, it would provide pollinator forage. Uh, it would uh, add nitrogen and uh, suppress weeds. And uh, we used paper mulch. Uh, very, very successfully. It was wonderful. You can't tell that bottom right picture. Um, these are mature. This is a variety called Siski Gold. And some of those, I mean, it turned into a Christmas tree farm. Some of those were eight feet tall. Um, on the left is an interesting challenge. And, and if any of you are cohabitating with beavers in your territory, this is a, a good little tidbit. Um, so we went to the effort 
of, uh, you can see in the top right now, these oaks on the edge of our hemp field, you can see a couple of the branches where we were able to reach and create some space for landing. And there's visual center in that picture. There's a bald eagle watching over our field. And that was the first day of our harvest. It was uh, uh, pretty fortuitous. But, you know, I'm going to go to the effort of creating those bird perches and then I'm going to come along and see that the beavers are trying to take down the trees. So we did a little bit of research, and, and uh, Ellie on the team uh, found a website where there were land managers talking about integrating a little bit of uh, 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 contractor sand, uh, like, like just building basic cheap sand, dump it into some exterior paint, and paint the tree. And beavers are so protective of their teeth uh, that they'll sense the grit and they'll reconsider. That was, that was the wording used. And you can see the points of reconsideration here. Like they tested it over and over and over again and uh, kept reconsidering. Um, so our oaks still stand. Uh, yeah, if any of you have any questions about our, uh, our hemp thing, that's probably another conversation. Uh, we super believe in cover crops. We super believe in uh, uh, keeping ground covered and uh, fed. Um, and it was really, really a joyful experience bringing people to this field and having them just light up. And the ground was like spongy and uh, it was rad. It was a really cool experience. Uh, we've also experimented a bit with bat houses. Now, uh, people are pretty familiar with bat houses. Um, and these are Audubon Society bat houses. Uh, uh, so the the little accessory connected to the bottom is something that most people haven't seen. And, and this is a, uh, a cool feature to consider. Um, you know, in a natural bat situation, you probably wouldn't have like 40 or 50 feet straight down to a hard surface. Like bats are usually probably kind of tucked up in a nook or something like that. So this is actually a pup catcher. And I made it out of old uh, aluminum uh, screen that I had in the garage and some... Uh, what are those? Those are garden stakes, I guess. Just drilled it together. And so when the pups fall, uh, they get caught by that little taco, and then the screen, the ladder to get back up to their folk. And, uh, and you do better with your bat population that way. You don't, you don't lose the little ones. Um, so uh, we put one of these up high on a really, really proud, beautiful white pine up above our event space, and then uh, another one on a really beautiful birch up above our goats in the permanent paddock. Um, so let's see. Yeah, now we're, we're wrapping up our second full year of like really hardcore going after creating migratory bird habitat. And, uh, and so now we've gotten a little bit of recognition for it and we're getting better at it. And so we're thinking of seeking some affiliations and grant funding to continue, uh, growing this effort. And there is a lot out there. Like there are little passion projects. People are so excited about Purple Martin are a huge one. So, uh, we got this Purple Martin house established a little bit too late in the season, and we ended up uh, just hosting more eastern bluebirds in that space. Um, but ready to go for this year. We'll clean it up and get some Purple Martin. Um, loons are another treasure of the north. They have a million songs, and they are just endlessly melodic, and they're beautiful and uh, fun to share space with in the lake. And they've been coming around the last couple of years, uh, I want to learn what I can do to maybe create like a quiet nesting zone for them. Um, and then there's a lot in raptor rehabilitation in this region. Um, I didn't realize it. I had a raptor expert recently tell me that uh, the reason you don't want to throw apple cores and banana peels out of your car window is that it attracts rodents. And then our favorite large birds, go after the rodent and they don't have the run up space to not get tagged by a car when they're trying to fly away. And uh, so a lot of owls and uh, hawks and eagles get hit by cars up here uh, just because they're going after side of the road litter. So uh, yeah, bummer. Don't, don't think about it too hard. You probably didn't kill a bird, but maybe reconsider next time you're thinking about throwing a micro core out your window. Um, in the car, unless you're on like a super, super slow road, think about that. Um, but yeah, I would really like the idea of uh, taking my break, walking through the orchard with a 
hawk on my shoulder directing right after the gophers, <laughs> right after the mice, right after the voles. Um, so we'll see how it goes. Uh, now, okay, now I want to talk about you all getting involved. And, and here are a couple of things that most people don't consider, and it's a super sad thing. It's easy to avoid. Uh, windows are a huge threat to songbirds. So if you're building these habitats near a structure with windows, please consider something to make the reflection interrupted. Um, and I know that's asking a lot because we like looking out our windows. Um, this is what the American Bird Conservancy recommends. I honestly, I would just recommend keeping them a little bit further away from your house. Um, that's, that's huge. If, if you really want them close to your house, make sure that they are able to tell that they're, uh, you know, they're not welcome to go through your windows. Um, let's see. Yeah, maybe a couple that I, I might have missed. So this was, uh, this was how Kim ended all of her slideshows, and, and she had this uh, uh, landscape that I, I didn't borrow that uh, picture from her. But uh, the top one is plant-native plants. So she was already a Savannah Institute enthusiast without even realizing it. Um, you want to make sure water is close or visible. So if you want to pick a habitat that's close to water, that's great. Um, you can put out a bird bath. Uh, it's good if there's a bird bath. It's better if there's some movement in the water. And they actually make, um, you know, most ag co-ops, hardware stores sell like a little uh, solar water pump that'll bubble, and they're ten, fifteen bucks. Um, if you're if you're okay with plastic, you can throw one of those in your bird bath, and it'll bubble the water, and uh, you can get water basically anywhere. So uh, install, maintain birdhouses. You know, I, I set the specs at the beginning of this, but I'd be happy to go over that again if anybody has any questions. In terms of maintenance, during the month of March, just get out and, and you know, don't breathe it in. when you. But all of these houses are going to have a slide down or a swing open front door. And every season, you want to just clear out the houses so it's just free of all of the old junk and pathogens and parasites or whatever, right? Um, you don't have to spray anything. Uh, sometimes, like, I'll, I'll leave the door off of them for a day and then go put them back up if it's a messy one. It, it's usually not. Like, usually just dust out. You can just put it down on the ground, and it'll get used up by others. If, if you, uh, you know, pitch it somewhere into your compost pile or whatever, if you don't want to mess. Um, I mentioned build brush piles when possible. Leave trunks of fallen trees standing. That's great for birds. Um, this is nuts, but cats... Uh, are seriously killing on the order of billions of songbirds every year. So and it's a tough, uh, tough question for farms because we kind of need them for mousers. But if you're trying to attract birds, you might want to keep your cats indoors. They're killing machines. Uh, reduce window reflections and share your successes. This is a big thing that Kim was about and, and a huge reason, well, the only reason why I have uh, – um, a successful program going on with uh, with birds on the farm here is she um, is always looking for a way to share the good news that she has, you know, and and uh, and we build community in that way. That's how elders become elders, and not just like an older person down the street that knows more than you. Like some people just grow old. Uh, let's opt into being an elder and sharing what we have learned. And, uh, and we can all build off of each other's successes. Uh, so, yeah, there's, there's some basic ideas to get started. Uh, I don't know how we're doing on time. should check. Yeah, that's about right. Uh, so here, yeah, check us out for yourself. There's some details on Lily Springs Farm. We've got a really cool website, and uh, if I do say so. <laughs> and uh, on Instagram, you can follow me individually, at Drew Slevin, at Lily Springs Farm. And there's my email on an email. I, this time of year, I've got a chainsaw in my hands more than I've got my keyboard. So uh, don't expect immediate replies. But feel free to contact me if you want to. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, Katie, are you around? Are you going to open up for questions? Yeah, thanks so much, Drew. If you have a question, please drop it in the chat box, and I will read it over to Drew, and we'll get those answered. If you're joining us by phone, um, after a couple of questions, I will open it up so that you may ask a question over the phone and dial in to do that. But as folks are getting their questions ready, Drew, I have a, uh, one thing that I am interested in learning about is you mentioned a couple slides back 
that you're looking into grant and funding opportunities to expand your work. Have you come across anything recently um, that either a cost share or an opportunity to get funding to bring this to the farm? Yeah, they're, and they're species specific. So, um, yeah, you know, there's there's the classic like there are SARE grants probably that come up every once in a while for that sort of thing. I'm I'm actually not the one on our staff that does these searches, but when I was talking to Kim about it last time, um, she told me to look into organizations that are specifically focused on uh, purple martins and loons, and she said there was uh, enthusiasm behind it and that we have the perfect setting for it. That actually does bring up a tip that I was going to include, and I think I maybe. Uh, lost it when I this uh this presentation got deleted by accident uh this morning so uh, this is round two um but the um uh opening yourself up to avian ecologists in your community is a really really useful thing it was just a thrill to walk the property with Kim and and have her stop and say uh oh did you hear that one he says, and then she'd say the song in like this, uh, like representative onomatopoeia style, like way birders remember bird song. And then, you know, she built a list of like, I think 78 birds the first time she visited. And then we sat down after the walk and I was able to say like, okay, here are the things that I'm dealing with on the land. Are any of these dudes available to do this work for me? And, uh, and she was like, oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and that was how we broke it down. That was how we moved into the, the uh, putting them to work conversation. And, uh, and I'm sure that there are regional experts like that all over the place. I actually, uh, one of my favorite mentors in the community here, um, we reconnected. I had no idea he was a birder. And we started doing this, and I took him over to his property, and um, he impressed us all. That's uh, uh, Dan from Common Harvest Farm across town. So, yeah, there are lots and lots of opportunities. And I, I would say connect with a local birder and find out, uh, like, who your roster of birds is that, you're, uh, that you have available to you, and, and you may be able to find more based on that. Thanks so much, Joe. Um, one thing before we wrap up for the evening is you've put your third year goals, but I know that folks uh, who work in, in perennial landscapes often think in larger chunks of time in five and 15 and oh, yeah. 20 and 50 year goals. So what do you see stretching into the future as you build this habitat that's welcome to all species? That's awesome. Yeah, that's a really good question. So, so these, um, these bird houses are a, a uh, a case of biomimicry, right? Or, or, or like uh, nature mimicry, like we're mimicking a cavity nest. So we're mimicking a, a decaying tree. We're mimicking a, a nook in the, in the woods. Um, healthy forests have all of this habitat, like healthy landscapes have all of that habitat. And so just like we would input manure in a space that doesn't have enough forage to silvopasture, um, we're going to have to input manure for those perennial plants that are going to need to be fertilized. We're going to have to input wood chips into a new uh, forest system that hasn't been established and doesn't have that decay cycle underway, you know. Um, so these early efforts are to inoculate the land with the diversity that we need. And then my hope is, you know, we're, we'll continue to manage the forest in order to broaden it's holding capacity for biodiversity and will continue to build our food forests so that they will have the same. The, the windrows that we've established include basswood and oak and walnut and, and uh, you know, and a shrub layer too. We've got choke cherry and, and uh, it, it, it's a fun project to consider the long term. And yeah, that's um, one of the coolest things about, uh, about this audience that we're, we're really thinking about a long lasting impact. Well, Drew, I just want to thank you so much for, for all of your work and sharing that with us today. I know that I'm going to take what you said today and bring it into the work on the demonstration farms here in Illinois. Um, but as, just as a wrap-up to let everyone on the line know that we did record this and it will be posted on YouTube in about a week or so, and I'll send everyone a link to that recording. 
Um, and also in that email you're going to receive, you're going to have a link to an evaluation and we would love to hear your feedback as we strengthen this program and really start to target what folks want to take into their lives and onto their lands. So Drew, thank you so much again for, uh, for tonight and happy spring is on the horizon. Oh man, my pleasure. Thank you so much for including me and, and for shining a spotlight on all of the good work that you're showing off. This is a, an honor to be included. And, and I, I don't take it lightly. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Please check out past nutshells and sign up for future ones. And we'll see you online or at a field day this season. Have a wonderful evening.